if you have a client that shows up on Zoom with a bright orange dress on and a star on her head, please say something about the dress and the star, right? <laughs> say something because she's asking you to utilize this in your interaction with her. She's yeah. asking for the level of significance. Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. There's no recovery from a bad first impression, both in dating and sales. Your sales reps need to sell better and smarter from the onset to ensure a good customer experience. That is why you should visit calidascloud.com forward slash vengresso to view the webinar recording that will change your perspective on the selling experience and how you can improve. That's calidascloud.com forward slash vengresso, C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S-C-L-O-U-D.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. And now on to this episode of Selling with Social. Mr. Rod Harrison, <laughs> oh man, this is back for round number two. We um, are back. We are back. For all of my listeners in uh, for Selling with Social, you've probably heard me only say this now officially three times, only three times this has happened in Selling with Social history, and we are actually going on episode 100. Very, very, very close. For those of you listening in, we are about to hit number 100, and in 100 episodes, we have never had but more than three people back to the Selling with Social podcast. And Rod, you are one of those three. Awesome. I'm honored. Honored. <laughs> You've made history, my friend. You've made history. So let's, <laughs> let's reintroduce you because uh, some folks may be listening in for the first time of our podcast listeners here. And as you know, we've got sales. We've got sales leadership. We've got marketing business owners listening in. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Harrison, who you are and what you are all about. Well, you know, I'm here to serve. And uh, I got started in the influence business in the military. I uh, was in the military for 11 years and uh, was fortunate enough to join, to be invited to the mobile comm team. It was a new unit that did all of the training for the SEAL teams, the CIA, the DEA, and we worked for civilian communication companies in the latest and greatest technology. And uh, I had a chance to be an instructor for SEAL tactical training around communication. And it's so interesting watching some of the greatest operators and greatest warriors come through that training and realize that it was all around psychology and your ability to influence. You had to switch it up. You had to sell these guys and now women into learning, expanding, growing. It wasn't one size fit all. And I think the salespeople can really benefit from that. I got out of the military and very quickly utilized my military experience to get in with uh, Anthony Robbins. I became a master trainer there. After being a field sales rep for him and leading that team, it was easy to build my company, Envision You, that focused on sales training, leadership training, culture transformation. And, and again, later, in, and we got into a great organization, Rock Financial, that turned to Quicken Loans. And Danny Gilbert, that owns Quicken Loans, partnered with our organization, invested in us. And uh, that's when we bought the company, National Association of Sales Professionals. And we really started thinking about how to build a home and community for salespeople to really give them the significance they deserve really show them that they are the heartbeat of the organization. And sometimes we're not treated that way. So I always look at myself as there's really no such thing as an entrepreneur. It's just a salesperson has to sell his team, himself, the customers, 
and a vision that we can accomplish. And I'm sure you'll agree with that, Mario. Oh, 100 percent. Absolutely. I mean, what, quite frankly, if you look at a salesperson, you are an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You own a business within a business. That's exactly uh, right. I love that. And the last time we had you on, we started out talking about the 12 steps to persuasion, the art of persuasion. And uh, we got through steps one through eight, but we didn't finish nine through 12. Mm -hmm. And so for all of you listening in, in the show notes, actually, you'll see a reference back to the first eight steps with Rod Harrison that was done a couple months back. And this is now going to be the follow-up for the steps number nine, 10, 11, and 12. So if you missed one through eight and you're tuning in for the first time, make sure you go back to listen in to steps one through eight. But Rod, before we get into step number nine, which I'm very curious what this is gonna be, given the eight that you gave, I wanna know something that nobody would know about you by looking at your social profile. I won a scholarship for playwriting. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how long, how long ago was that? That was many, many years ago? Many, many years ago, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's how I, they paid for a large part of my um, college. And I wrote plays and, uh, and they did really well. Wow, okay, so you got a playwriter. And then if I'm not mistaken, you told us the last time that you were also a songwriter and you play uh, musical instruments as well. Yeah, I'm learning to play. Oh, you learn to play, okay, so you were a songwriter. Yes. That's right. I'm a writer and a playwright. I got this little creative bug. I write books. I, I really enjoy expressing my creativity and writing and in speaking. I love it. Fantastic. Well, there you have a songwriter, playwriter, and now a leader in uh, leadership training and sales training. So let's get right into it, my friend. Absolutely. I want to know. We left off, if I'm not mistaken, we left off talking about step number eight, and that was engage with imagination. And it was talking about the story of possibilities and using that in helping to persuade individuals to wherever it is that you want them to do or to go. So step number nine, let's get right into it. Talk to me about that. What is that? Step number nine is beautiful. And salespeople, you know this. So for some of you, this is going to be a refresher. For some of you, this is imperative. Because when we talk about engaging imagination and the way you do that is you have to understand the frames. You have to understand framing. Again, I know in any situation that I'm going into, I have to either pre-frame, reframe, or deframe, right? And I know that that's the most powerful sales professionals in the world are not afraid to pre-frame. What does that mean? That means that I'm going to handle the objections before I go into the sale. That means that I'm going to bring up everything that a person could think that could take them away from the value that I'm offering before I go into my pitch. So I'll give you a great example. I just had a client, CDG. I knew that this company was very conservative, but I knew that they needed a board breaking program that we were doing. Cause that's, they only gave me three and a half hours. It was 2,200 people and they wanted something impactful, but in three and a half hours and they gave me, And so I knew all of this before I talked to the leadership of the organization. So I went in and I said to them, you're going to say that this is risky, that this is outside of our comfort zone, that this is something that we don't do as an organization. You're going to say that it's putting us on the spot a little bit. You're going to say that this is too far removed from what we would do ordinarily. And when you say that, I'm going to remind you that you're asking me to help you get outside of your comfort zone. When you say that, I'm going to remind you that you're saying that you want your people to be leaders and deal with uncertainty better. When you say that, I'm going to remind you that you said, Rod, we trust you. You've been doing this now for 25 years. So let me get into what I'm offering. So that's a preframe. I'm already telling them exactly what they're going to say. And they can't object to it because they don't know what I'm going to say. (laughs) <laughs> right, right, right. And what sure. I did was, so pre-framing is very, very, very important because people operate in patterns. We no longer think. We operate in patterns. We know exactly how we're going to respond to things before you even bring things up. And so if you allow that to become a reframe, you're not being an effective influencer. You're not being an effective sales professional. So a reframe would be I go into the presentation and say, I think we ought to do board breaking. And they say, no, 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 
We don't do things like that. We're a conservative organization. It's outside of the ordinary. And then I would go, you told me you want to step outside of your comfort zone. Now I've made this person take a stand and now I'm reframing. Sometimes you have to reframe and here are the rules around reframing. And reframing, if rapport is established and maintained, whoever has the most certainty is gonna influence the situation. So I know that if I got to get in a reframe, now guys, let me tell you something that's so important. About 80% of the time, I have to reframe even after I preframe, but it's weaker. The reframe is weaker. They're more soft about it. I don't want a guy like Mario saying, Rod, that's just something we don't do. How am I going to back him off of that? That means I didn't do my job. I got to get Mario going, yeah, I hear you, man. But now if I get Mario going that route, Mario's saying he can be influenced with yeah. that type of physiology. Yeah. So that's what pre-frame, that's what it will do. That allowed me to go into a reframe and really now continue to take an equal posture. Now, I don't want to take a superior posture. And remember, there's three postures that we take when we're selling. An equal, a superior, or an inferior posture. As a sales professional, we got to get rid of this whole thing of, I apologize for wasting your time. I know mm. your time is valuable. No more of that crap. No more of that crap. You're putting yourself in an inferior posture. Why would I say your time is valuable when I'm saying I'm bringing something to your company that can actually transform it or take it to the next level, right? So be careful about apologizing for time. If you're going to do that, apologize for both. Your time and my time are really valuable. Let's get right to it. Yeah. Make sure that you exactly. maintain an equal posture because you're looking for that equal exchange. Be careful about going into a superior posture too, especially if you're talking to a leader or somebody like Mario that's being very nice to you. Don't take a superior posture, not the way you want to go, because again, he's resourceful and he wants to work with people he's going to enjoy working with, not just getting a result. So even if you have something that is going to bring products and systems and opportunity, be careful about that and be very careful about taking an inferior posture. People will like you. You'll make them feel good, but they won't respect you enough to buy from you, right? So equal posture is the way you want to go in everything that you say, and especially in a reframe. Now, a deframe is where I actually change the context. I actually change what we're actually talking about. So a deframe would be, I do a preframe about board breaking with Mario. He doesn't buy it. I do a reframe. He goes, I don't know, Rod. You know, I should have thought about this. A deframe would be, you know, Mario, in all due respect, I kind of thought that this would be a little bit above your head, that I kind of saw that you were that kind of play it safe type leader. And uh, I should have thought about that before coming in here. And I really apologize. I think that uh, the leaders that we work with, are way more courageous and they're willing to take, not take chances, but take intelligent risks and recognize that if we've done this for 25 years, it's not going to be, they're not going to be the first one. So I apologize for coming in thinking you were that type. Now that's dangerous to do, but you only do that when you're going to lose the cell. And you'll be surprised at how many times people will go, well, wait a minute, what are you saying? Well, I'm not saying anything. I'm saying you can run the organization the way you want. I just thought you were a bit more courageous in how you did things when you brought us in. Mm -hmm. Well, you say I'm not courageous. No, I'm saying I think that you're falling into that pattern. I've been able to turn that around. Again, you only want to use the D frame when you absolutely have to. And a lot of times I'll only use it when the leader is kind of being disrespectful a little bit and that I want to kind of make sure that I leave there with the proper posture for myself for the next sale. Mm -hmm. right? And so right. I never, right, I don't want to leave that situation feeling defeated when the person wasn't going to do anything anyway. The scenario that you gave is a very dangerous slope, right? I mean, like that one is like, <laughs> you've got to be pretty ballsy to go to do that. <laughs> and I understand the circumstances by which you describe when you want to deframe something. Another way you might look at the deframe uh, methodology is, and this is a great scenario that I think falls into this category, and I'll give it to you and you tell me if it falls into this category. Oftentimes, there's a lot of companies that come to us and say, hey, we want your digital sales training, 
and we only want you in for half day program or for a full day program. And ultimately my question is, is what do you want to get out of this? What do you want people to walk away with? And you oftentimes it's, well, I want them to learn how to use video or LinkedIn. For what reason though? Well, so they can create more new conversations. Okay, so you want them to be taught a skill set in less than four hours and teach them how to prospect using a particular tool. Is that correct? Yes, exactly right. Well, we're probably not the right provider for you. Why is that? Well, here's the reason why. You can't teach salespeople how to fish in just four hours. There's a whole skill set that goes along with it. And the type of provider you're looking for is probably the small consultant that may be happy to come in and teach you a little bit here and there of LinkedIn, but that's not what we do. Our goal is to help you create more conversations. And before we even start with more conversations and teaching you how to fish, we got to fix this problem and then this problem first, which is the content and your bait and your profiles. Then we can come in and teach skill set. So I'm not sure if we're the right type of fit for you, right? At that point, I think that's where more of that deframing where it's like- No, that, that, that is a beautiful deframe. That is a beautiful deframe. And that's probably, again, I'm giving you guys more of a deframe to where Mario is saying you only want to use it. And, I, and my reason for giving you that example is not to use it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're losing the deal, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. What Mario did is that he did a beautiful reframe and deframe in that example. And everybody should learn from that. That was beautifully done. But what he did was he didn't allow for the people in the, on the other side to really at all feel disrespected or, or have something taken away. It was really more of a beautiful realignment. And also, too, in the example that I gave, you have to know as a salesperson, and I think this is super important in terms of framing, right? This is like your pre-frame that you talked about. You have to know what is the type of customer that you want and the type of customer that you don't want. Right. This is super hard for a lot of sales folks, Rod, when we come to the type of customer that we want, the type of customer we don't want, because the reality is the statistics show that 60% of most sales reps are not hitting their quota. So pretty much anything that sticks on a wall <laughs> or that looks like it'll stick on a wall, most salespeople are trying to go after it to be able to, right. stick, to make it stick, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's super hard. And don't get me wrong, it's a tough conversation when I've had to tell customers I'd love to take your money and I'd love to charge you a quarter million dollars for a training program for your entire sales organization, but I don't want to take your money. It would be criminal for me to do that. And that type of, I think that persuasion, that deframing makes them want to say, in my opinion, makes them want to say, well, well, wait a minute. If you won't do that with us, what would you do? Now it opens up in that possibilities that you were talking about, about going back to our last show about engaging the imaginations. I just told you I, we wouldn't do that. And this is here are some reasons why. And they're like, okay, well, tell me, understand what would you do? Now I've created that curiosity of imagining the possibilities of what could it be? Absolutely. And in an analytical persuasion, you've become the authority. In that situation, guys, that's very, very powerful. And that's a better use of D-frame. So in the first example, you want to know what it is and how it could be a really tough one and you want to really stay away from that. However, if you're in a very toxic situation, which some of us are, then what you want to do is you want to create the proper posture for yourself in the next experience. Don't lose. Again, in some situations, you got to maintain that level of self-respect. And some of you, you get into situations you, you're going to do it. About 90% of the time, the example Mario gave you is more than a D-frame. In fact, Guys, he gave you utilization, he gave you pre-frame, and he gave you engaged imagination. And what that equal is being an authority. And right now, that's what organizations are looking for. They're looking for certainty, and you become that certainty. So that's beautiful. Thank you for that. Well, you know what, too, Rod? I'm going to go back to the one that you gave, though, which was pretty ballsy. It's pretty risky. But let me tell you the scenario that I think might work well in that for salespeople and sales leaders. And, and I'm gonna rewind back way many years ago. And I used to have the public sector and federal for all of California. And uh, we had a client and boy, this client, man, she was a pill. She was a pill. The reputation amongst all of federal and public sector reps across our entire industry was that nobody liked her. 
Nobody wants to deal with her. She would yell at you. She'd scream at you. She'd stomp her feet. She would go over your head and she would do anything she wants. So I was like, look, there's very few people that I have never been able to not get to like. me. I think I'm a likable guy, but I'm also a direct guy. And so I befriended her. We started to get to know one another, took her team out to lunch one day, had a great conversation. And she even said in this conversation, boy, if I had a son, I would love him to be just like you. Right. And so she was of Latin descent. And I was like, okay, I got this. Right. <laughs> so about six months into our relationship, she was ticked off at one of our account executives. And so she called me up. She was mad. I understood why she was mad and I could understand, but there was a reason why he made a choice to do the, what he did in terms of giving her the pricing and the solution that he gave. And I also understood that, but then she did this. She started because I would not change and overrule the decision. She started berating him, calling him specifically an idiot and stupid. Now the first few times I let it go. And then the next times I said, now come on and let's just call her name Penny, Penny for the sake of discussion here. I was like, Penny, Now, you know that this individual is not an idiot or stupid. And the fact that you're calling him an idiot or stupid makes me question your motive behind what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So let's not call him an idiot or stupid anymore, but let's continue on with trying to help you find the right solution that might meet your needs if you really think this is not something that's going to meet your needs. So she kept going and she continued to refer to him and all the different events because she was so mad she wasn't getting her way that she kept calling him an idiot. And I said to her, he said, you know what? I'm not sure if you're the type of customer that we would want to deal with. And she said, what? And I said, I'm not sure if you're the type of customer. I think I told you already that it's inappropriate and I find it highly un- unacceptable for common business practice for you to be calling someone an idiot, even if I think that person is an idiot, right? And I'm like, it's just unacceptable. So I'll tell you what, you're welcome to go ahead and cancel all your services. I don't think you're the type of customer that I want to work with. Now she was furious and she went to my, my boss and uh, my boss called me up and said, Hey man, I got a call from Penny. (laughs) And and I said, you did, huh? And he said, yeah. (laughs) And he's like, man, I, I heard what you said, you know? And he was like, that's a lot of revenue that you'd be throwing away. And I said, listen, the type of clients that we want to deal with are not people that are going to call our people stupid and idiots. So I could care less because I'll go find another customer that will replace that revenue to not have to deal with that type of conversation. Because quite frankly, just the use of the word makes her look like an idiot, right? So (laughs) so it's like, I'm cool if you think someone, let's not call someone an idiot or stupid in that process. Now, what she did was she called, she ranted, you know, she raved and she never canceled her services. I told her, cancel them, go ahead and cancel them. She never canceled them, but she continued ordering, but she only wanted to deal with us through email. Oh, that's cool. That's fine. You were mad that you didn't get your way, but you kept ordering. And I was willing to tell you, hey, take a hike. Is that kind of the, a different? Yeah, well, be, well, and here's why. Here's another brilliant example. Because if you didn't do that, not only will she have canceled, because the pattern would have kept growing and growing. So a deframe is nothing more than a pattern interrupt. And that's something that I, I should have said that we, in seminars we teach it. Only time you deframe is when you know the person is stuck into a, in a pattern and that it's going to be disruptive to the overall room or the overall sale. So I'll do deframes in a seminar all the time because I'm about to lose the room and because I need to be the one that's respected in the room to get across what I need to get across, right? So you'll see a comedian do a deframe. You'll see. So that deframe you just did was not only necessary, it's the only thing that kept the account. You actually broke her pattern by actually becoming the alpha and you maintain respect. Because you got to remember, when like, trust, or respect is gone and in a relationship, it's over. Yeah. And to your point, LinkedIn just published the State of Sales 2018 report and the survey with over 600 respondents, B2B buyers. They asked, what were the top reasons why you purchased from your sales rep? And 51%, the number one reason was trust. Right. Trust, right? So our job is to build trust, but it's also not to be a walking, like as I told my boss back then, hey, I'm nobody's walking doormat. That's for darn sure. (laughs) Well, right. If you allow me to say something racist on a call with you, just exactly, then how much am I going to trust you? Sure, sure. You know what I mean? If you allow me to do something that you just told me, I don't trust that you're going to follow through. And when you say I'm uncomfortable with that and she keeps going, 
now is really a fight of integrity at this point. Sure. Are you just going to back off what you just said in a very confident manner? This is uncomfortable for me. And then you're going to back off because it's a sale. No, I think that that's beautiful. That's beautiful on that. And people should really, really learn that in that case, a D frame is absolutely necessary for the sale and for the other person. Because she learned a lesson in that situation and it probably saved her job maybe for not calling other people idiots, right? Because she had somebody stand up and set a standard. Although she worked for the government, so you you really can't oh, be yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No offense to any of my, my public yes. sector or federal yeah. uh, listeners out there, but the reality yeah. is that's that's a tough role that's to be true. able to be fired that's from, true. I tell you that much. So I want to go into step number ten. But before we do that, before we tee up step number ten, I want y'all listen in right now to this message from our program sponsor. Do you feel like your sales team spends more time updating and completing administrative tasks than they do engaging with customers? CRM was supposed to automate the sales process, but instead created more manual processes. SAP Sales Cloud introduces modern CRM to the industry so that you can sell more and enable your team to be more efficient, effective, and intelligent. SAP Sales Cloud offers solutions to optimize your sales process, accelerate quotes and contracts, and enable corporate learning. No matter what industry you're in, you can build processes around what your salespeople do best. With SAP Sales Cloud, sales as you know it is about to change. Learn more by visiting calidusclouddotcom forward slash Vengresso today. That's C A L L. I-D-U-S cloud.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. So right before that message from our program sponsor, we were talking about the ninth step framing of the 12 steps of persuasion. And now I asked you to talk about step number 10. Let's get into step number 10. What is that? Step number 10 is utilization. So the best sales professionals in the world think utilization. What does that mean? Well, when I walk into a room, when I walk into any situation, I'm focused more on being so in the moment, being so in state that I utilize anything and everything that comes up. If I walk into somebody's office and I see that it's sports jerseys all over talking about the Chicago Bulls or the Boston Celtics, then they're telling me what to utilize as far as our relationship is going to go. If I walk into a situation and the lights go out, if I walk into a situation and he's late coming in, I utilize everything towards the ultimate outcome that is a win-win outcome, of course. So utilization is less a science and more a belief system and art. So I I remember being in a in a situation where I was going in to do a workshop for, there was an old folks home and they loved Tony Robbins and they had 30 people that wanted to go to a Tony Robbins event. And I went in to do a workshop and the person, the manager loved it. The manager really thought that he would get all of his people to go. I was a young sales guy. So this was going to be a great event. I get to the door and there's a guy in a wheelchair, an old man in his underwear right? Saying, Sonny, can you hold the door for me? And the only way he can get out is I would have to hold the door. And Uh, everything in my body was like, do not open this door for this guy. (laughs) He's trying to escape. (laughs) He's trying to escape. I don't know what I was thinking. I opened the door and he's gone. And I hear, (laughs) Leroy's escaped again. (laughs) He's in the middle of the freaking four lane highway, rolling down, And they had to go grab him and bring him back. And he's swearing when he came back. And everybody knew I let him out. Everybody knew it was me. He's looking at me, swearing, did you tell on me? (laughs) You know? And so utilization is, I said, guys, I was so happy to come here. (laughs) The sun (laughs) was out. I thought this would be my best meeting ever. I was so pumped when I talked to the manager and he said he loved Tony Robbins. I had some tough goals and I thought, Finally, I'm getting there. I get here. It starts hailing, not even raining. It starts hailing. 
it gets dark and there's an old man in a diaper at the door and everything in my head said no but guess what i did i opened the door anyway guys if you guys want to kick me out right now you should and they all just started laughing and it turned out to be the best event ever you got to utilize things that go on. You got to get to a place of vulnerability and just use it. I ended up selling 35 tickets out of 30 people. And wow. right, only because I was vulnerable enough to say I'm human and utilize that situation. Make it humorous, but also be vulnerable and talk about exactly how dangerous that was to do it. And just yeah. speak to that I was nervous. And everybody understood and came to my defense. Not only that, they loved how I was able to reframe that situation. Yeah, love that. I was working with uh, Vivica Von Rosen earlier today as we were going through and putting together the new Selling with LinkedIn on-demand course that we're getting ready to launch. There's a module inside there, and the module is how to find the big fish on the wall. <laughs> and it's exactly as you described. Uh, in the old days, we had a lot more face-to-face -face meetings, you know, handshakes with people in their offices, right? And I say old days, rewind back five years and going backwards, right? That's not too far old, old days, but things have dramatically changed where many of our meetings are now being hosted virtually through virtual rooms, just like the one we're in right now. We're just watching each other, seeing each other face to face right here, right? The only thing we can't do is actually physically shake hands, right? But we can high five each other right through the <laughs> virtual room. The thing about this is when we talk about the big fish on the wall, you're talking about utilization. You use, utilize anything that comes up to help create conversation, to stimulate conversation, to move the opportunity along, to build trust. Those are all the things. And so what we talk about is how to find the big fish on the wall. If we no longer can meet in person, meaning I can't get to your office, how do I find what we used to call the big fish on the wall? If you saw the big fish, or maybe it was the family picture, or maybe it was the sports jerseys, like you gave the example of a trophy. Like there was usually something inside of someone's office that you could utilize to create an opening part of your conversation. Absolutely. And now, as a result of what I would say, 70% of most of our meetings are done virtually. 70%, right, done virtually. Now, how do you find that big fish on the wall? or that trophy or that jersey, right? And that's where platforms like social media platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter, that really help you to be able to find what we call the big fish on the wall. So for those of you listening in, you'll see that you know we're talking about our Selling with LinkedIn course and to Rod's point, utilization is utilizing something and I call it how to find the big fish on the wall. Are we talking about the same thing, Rod? Absolutely, absolutely. People give you clues, right? If you have a client that shows up on Zoom with a bright orange dress on and a star on her head, please say something about the dress and the star, right? Say something because she's asking you to utilize this in your interaction with her. She's asking for the level of significance. So if I have a big fish on a wall, I'm looking for significance. If I have friends and family all over, I'm saying utilize the connection that I have in my heart. If I have awards and personal development things and pictures of people that, then I'm saying I'm a growth guy, please utilize that, right? If I have a bat in my office and a sword and, and I got boxing gloves and I'm saying, hey, then I need that level of confidence. I need you to acknowledge I'm a strong guy or that I need that. Utilize what you see, utilize it. It's there for a reason. Exactly. Right? And this is where I think a lot of sales reps miss the opportunity is to, I cannot tell you as, as a buyer on the buying side, when I get on a prospecting meeting of which I'm being prospected to, oftentimes sales reps want to get right into it, right? They booked a 15 minute call, which is why I hate 15 minute calls. I think they're <laughs> stupid and they only apply at a very specific point in time after you've already engaged in the conversation, right? Absolutely. But that having been said, I'm not going to go into that. I, I, my rant on that one, but as soon as they get on the call, it's like, okay, Mario, uh, the objective for today's meeting is, and they go right into it. And I'm like, what about building rapport? What about your words being vulnerable, right? right. And a great scenario is uh, I had a call earlier today and we got on the call and the buyer opened up with, hey, you know, how, how's everything going in your neck of the woods? Oh, actually not too well. What do you mean? Well, you may have heard about the California fires. Yeah, I heard about that. 
Well, actually, our area right now is sitting at 300, whatever the, the ratings is, 300 PI. I forget what the acronym is. I said, which is actually very hazardous to your health. So I had to take my family, go down from Northern California. We went down to Southern California, rented an Airbnb. We're probably here through Thanksgiving. And he was like, is it really that bad? And out of the 30-minute call, we spent about 10 minutes just doing a rapport building. And you know, all of a sudden, we moves into a uh, man. Hey, by the way, we close out the call. But I'm super sorry about everything that's going on. And then absolutely no problem. And now we've become human. I've become a real person that we built right. a relationship with, right? right? Bringing that human right. back, the old fashioned way of selling, right? Absolutely. What I call old fashioned, it's not dead in terms of no. human to human. And absolutely. Just because you've got digital doesn't mean that you don't utilize the big fish on the wall scenario, right? Absolutely. Um, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. All right. It tells us what we need to do. Tells us what we need to do. (laughs) Number 11 is what you just did. You gave a great example of a pattern interrupt. So remember, especially in a digital age, you're interrupting someone. You're an interruption if you're selling them something, even if they set the appointment. Even if they said, I want to talk to you, you're interrupting something if they don't have your services already. If they have to be sold on your services, and you're interrupting something else that they would or could be doing. So that means that if there's going to be an interruption, you have to understand that I set a meeting with you, my physiology is down, you have to interrupt my pattern. And my pattern is to be disrupted by you, even though I set the meeting. So a great pattern interrupt is exactly what the example you gave what's going on on your side of the woods instead of getting right into the presentation or asking a question that has nothing to do with what I'm expecting you to do. You know, in retail sales, the salesperson that comes up and says, may I help you? My response, I practiced this for 45 years. No, I'm just looking. I'm not just looking. Guys, especially guys, we don't go to the freaking mall to look. <laughs> We're there for a reason. We're not just there looking. But you didn't do anything to interrupt my pattern. In fact, you fed my pattern by asking a question that everybody else would ask. And I just kind of remember the most powerful sales professionals coming up asking, where'd you get those shoes? Dude, you didn't get those here, did you? Now, the pattern in this, I don't even know what, I got to stop and think. (laughs) Right. I can't go into my pattern. He asked me a question. Questions are the best pattern interrupts, right? Are yeah. coming up, if you see some of the best sales professionals, they'll come up and go, oh my God, do you know who you look like? And they'll say something, somebody really handsome that you know that they're making it up, but they broke your pattern and you really enjoyed it. The person took the time to interrupt your pattern when you're in their store. And this sort of digital meeting place, pattern interrupts are so important right? So important. Humor is a beautiful pattern to interrupt. Even if you don't have humor, the attempt at humor is better than the person that just wants to get right to work when they're selling you something. To Mario's point, once the sale is done, then yeah, you can get right to it because I might, I tell you that, okay, you've sold me. So you have the right to be in my pattern yeah, <laughs> but right yeah. now. You are a interrupt to my pattern. And yeah. so you better be the pattern interrupt. You better take the place. You've got to knock that whole thing off. And that's a, a small D frame as well. So I don't know how many retail sales folks that we have listening to the podcast here, but I'll tell you a story, Rod, you may not know, but I actually started out in retail sales working for a company, which has unfortunately gone out of business by the name of Ritz Camera Centers. Do you remember them? Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Big time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so they used to develop all the, I used to be a photo finisher. And I told the story before here on the podcast, but after a couple of years working with them, one day the regional manager came in and he said he wanted to meet with me about some of the money. And I was like, oh, dang. I was like, yeah, what did I do? Because I used to handle the cash. I worked at a small store and handled the cash. And I was like, oh, shoot. And so he opened up his books and he's like, look at these numbers. And what he ended up telling me was, is I was leading uh, sales in the region over the full-time employees within his region, but I was a photo finisher, which was the guy that wasn't doing sales. And so he's like, I I don't understand how you're doing that. And I was like, oh, I don't know how I'm doing that. (laughs) So he asked me like, what exactly are you doing? And I would tell him, I was like, well, someone would be inside here and they would be picking up their photo. And I'd say to them, 
based upon their, how it came out, right? The, the actual photos, I would look, open it up, say, is these three photos? And I said, yeah, and I'd flip through them. And then I said, you know, have you seen the, in this case, 400 ISO 35 millimeter film yet? And they're like, uh, no, I usually get the 200. Let me show you the 400 ISO because I think with these pictures that you were trying to take in this scenario, it'd be better. And here's the reason why. And I put it into their hands, right? And show them that. Or if they had a camera, I'm like, hey, have you seen the new Canon, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, no, I haven't seen that. Let me show that to you. And I put it into their hands, right? So it's like, instead of saying, may I help you? And then of course I respond with, no, 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 I'm just looking. Same thing that you said. No, I'm just looking. <laughs> if you walk up to somebody and say, as they're looking at the new Apple iWatch or whatever it might be, but have you played with that one yet? No, I haven't touched it yet. Oh, let, let me give that over to you. And if you do that, you're actually yeah, putting that product right. in and you start moving product. Now, I didn't know I was doing this. I just was doing it as a result of just being on the floor and looking for innovative ways to help them have better pictures, right? Absolutely. It's called relating to another human. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. But the pattern interruption here, as you call it, pattern interrupt, they came in looking to just buy their pictures and move on out, right? So I was right. interrupting the pattern with, let me put something else in their hands to be able to look. And then I just started moving product. Boom. I just started upselling all these folks and selling on the extra warranty and, and this, that, and the other. And people would say, you know, no, I'm not interested in the warranty. And they say, okay, no problem. I said, look, I'm a photo finisher. I, I don't work behind the counter, but let me ask this question. Have you ever almost accidentally dropped your camera? And they're like, oh, absolutely. Well, look, I mean, for $25, you get actually full protection, full replacement in case that accident ever actually occurs. They're like, all right, all right, extra 25 bucks, go ahead and add it on. Okay. <laughs> that <laughs> so, sounds incredible. That was just that model and that mindset. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing then. And it just all came to fruition. All right. Pattern interrupt number 12, the 12th and final step. What do we got? It's called alignment. Alignment. So again, right now, people will set meetings with me. And they'll start before I can even pre-frame, right? They'll kind of go into, I know what you're here for. We had a physician that he set up a meeting with us and he, man, he was defensive when we walked in and he started this whole thing. I heard what you did with other doctors, but my facilities are different. They're taught differently. And I don't think this is going to work. Now, my, my alignment was always, I respect, I appreciate, right? I respect what you're saying. I appreciate what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying. And not but, but negates and aligns. And so in my alignment, it's very, very simple, folks. Dr. Moak, I completely appreciate what you're saying. In fact, your organizations are at the top of the game. And... You thinking this way is an intelligent way to think, and we've already thought that through. So you're going to be really pleased at what we present to you today, right? So I aligned before I sought to redirect. I appreciate and I respect and I agree and not but. If I'd have said I appreciate what you're saying, but you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> then I'm negating everything before the word but. So and is alignment but is negation i'm going to say something and it's my podcast so i get to say it <laughs> so all of you listening bear with me here work with me so you're basically saying rod rod we don't want any big butts no we don't want any big <laughs> butts. <laughs> <laughs> all right hopefully, hopefully, that, wasn't, yeah. hopefully that wasn't no, offensive to any of my listeners <laughs> no. that's going to be the title of this show no big butts <laughs> In the alignment frame as well, we don't know why this word works so well. And this is a really great word. A great book is influenced by Robert Cialdini. And he talks about the word because. Because is a very powerful word to have in an alignment frame. An alignment frame. So, you know, Mario, I agree with what you're saying. And what you're saying is very relevant to your situation. Because if you look back at the salespeople that's come in, this is exactly what they focused on. And this is why. And then I'll go into the reframe there. So remember the alignment and not however, not but, and, 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 and alone. Now I can negate myself. I'm negated myself with but. So I could say something like, you know, this is something that we don't do. This discount you're asking for is absolutely outside of 
what I've seen our organization do, but I think I can get this to work. I think I can make this work. So I'll negate what I said before, and it becomes even more powerful. So you only want but to negate yourself, never to negate the client. Because it's a beautiful frame, and is always never but. I love that. And that's actually something that I personally have to work on, whether it's internal or whether it's external, is not using but, however. Those are my two favorite words. And I, I got to work on it, man. I got to work on it. So the next time we talk, you have to ask me, how's my big butts and my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my big howevers? <laughs> All right. So only use but to negate yourself. That's fantastic. Use the word and and also use because no buts and no howevers unless you're using it to negate yourself. That's brilliant messaging, brilliant training. And it actually makes me think about the different messaging that we create for organizations in terms of a templatized messaging that we provide where they can customize that. And I think we use the word however inside one of our templates. And it's making me go back and think, if that's what we're doing, we got to figure out how to remove the butts and how to remove the howevers. I love it. And just practice it. Just practice hearing it for someone and think about how you feel now that you're aware of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So nine out of 12, uh, step number nine, framing. Step number 10, utilization. Step number 11, pattern interrupt. And step number 12, alignment. There you have it, my friends. Those <laughs> are the 12 steps between two different podcasts. We did uh, it. We did it. We finally did it, Rod. That's the best thing. So, Rod, do me a favor. What's the best way if someone wants to get a hold of you, they want to connect with you? Should they connect with you on LinkedIn and send you a personalized message saying that they heard you on Selling with Social? Absolutely. LinkedIn is wonderful. Our rod.hairston at nasp.com. That's a good one as well. Yeah, but I prefer LinkedIn. Let's go for it. Make sure you tell Rod. We'll have a profile inside the show notes. But in case you're looking for him, it's Rod, R-O-D-E, Harriston, H-A-I-R-S-T-O-N. And uh, make sure you connect and tell him that you heard him on Selling with Social. For all of you tuning in right now, don't leave yet. We've got this very important special message just for you. Rod, thanks for joining my show. And all of you listening, listen to this message right now. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. This podcast was brought to you by SAP Sales Cloud. Here's what I want you to do right now. Learn more about SAP Sales Cloud by visiting calidascloud.com forward slash Ben Gresso. That's C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S cloud.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.